to the message on Control G. Control G. And for you guys who were here last week, you'll remember that Control G is a reminder that we can undo guilt when we give God control of our lives. We can undo guilt personally when we accept his complete forgiveness of us. Then what we're going to talk about today is how we can undo guilt in our relationships with others when we forgive other people. And there's a relationship there. As God forgives us and as we fully accept his forgiveness of us, we're able to more forgive other people. And so this week we're going to be talking about that forgiveness of other people that comes and flows out of God's forgiveness of us. So today the whole focus is going to be on who it is that we need to forgive. Now before we get into that, I want to address something in how we see conflict. Conflict is an opportunity. Conflict is an opportunity. Conflict is not always bad. Usually when you talk about conflict, people immediately tense up and they have this awful feeling like, ooh, we got a conflict. In my experience, most people are conflict averse. They avoid it and they try to prevent it and when it happens, they run from it. That is not how we were wired and designed. Conflict can be bad. It can. But conflict can be a wonderful opportunity. And I want to give you guys some specific examples of how it can be an opportunity. We have an opportunity in conflict to glorify God in forgiveness. To glorify God in forgiving other people. Think about it. you got someone that you're upset with. Here you have an opportunity to show them what God looks like in his forgiveness and his grace and in his mercy. And then second, we get an opportunity to serve other people through forgiveness. Think of what forgive means. Give for. Give for. Forgive. We have an opportunity here to show someone that we love them by forgiving them. And we only get to do that because of a conflict. Because we've got something between us and one other person. We get a chance to serve other people. Note here the first two big great commandments, right? Glorify God, love others. We have to glorify God and serve other people. Third, another benefit of conflict. You get to become more like Christ. What would happen if next time you had a conflict or a fight, you thought, awesome. Here's an opportunity to become more like Christ, the gracious, merciful, forgiving Christ. Because that's what conflict presents for us. Last but not least, one of my favorites is conflict and forgiving other people allows us to break the dam of emotion. Because so many of us are conflict averse, we tend to run from it, we tend to prevent, we're not hurt by it. But that's not how it works. When we have real conflict, we're really hurt. And if you don't deal with it, it's going to go in and it's going to get compressed on top of a bunch of other stuff inside of you until over time it's going to come out, it's going to burst. And I can guarantee you, when we don't handle conflict the right way and when it bursts, you can't control how and you can't control when and it's never pretty. It really isn't. We're designed to handle it, address it, forgive, reconcile, and move on. And forgiveness gives us an incredible opportunity to break that dam of emotion with another person. Think about it this way. No pain, no gain. With our relationship. Right? We've talked a little about this before. We're all pretty comfortable that we have growing pains, right? As we grow up, right, our bones grow, muscles stretch, and these things grow at different times, and it hurts. But we accept that as we grow up as physical people, there's pain that goes with growing. But why don't we accept that when it comes to the growth of our relationships? Why do we push back and fight and pretend that it's not supposed to happen? Or you've ever, if you've ever worked out or if you've done some new activity and the other side you're sore. But you know if it's just a, it's a workout sore, right? You know you're stronger on the other side of that workout. You're actually more capable and stronger. Why do we expect our relationships to grow any differently? Your relationships are going to have conflict. It's inevitable. It's not whether or not it happens. It's how we handle it. And we need to look for it, expect it, and then, of course, forgive other people when we have those conflicts. Now, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, but I got this one, Scott. I've got this one conflict, this one pain that's so bad. If you think your pain is unbearable, look to the cross. 
Look to the cross, to my left, right in front of you on the right. Maybe you've got one hanging around your neck. Maybe you've got one in your house or your office. For me, the cross means a lot of things, but one of them is a wonderful reminder of the perspective I need to have on pain and the capability I have to withstand pain and to forgive other people. Because if Christ can go to that cross and forgive the people who put him on it, I can forgive whatever pain I've suffered. Now, conflict causes. I want to give you guys um, some places to look for. Think about it as like opportunities to flex your forgiveness muscles, okay? This is what you're going to be on the lookout for, for conflicts where you're going to need to exercise forgiveness. Number one would be basic misunderstandings. I just poor communication between people. Maybe you look at someone's, hey, I'll be there at 9. And they don't know whether that's 9 a.m. or p.m., right? And 9 a.m. comes and you're not there, but you met p.m., but you just didn't say it, and so they're a little bit upset, right? Minor misunderstanding, minor poor communication. Forgive, move on. Next, a little bit more challenging. People have differences in values, goals, and interests, right? Even in this very room, we're going to have different things that we value. So a practical example, maybe a couple is having an argument whether to spend money that they have on a vacation or home improvement, and one has a, a certain goal in mind on how to do this, and the other person has a certain goal in mind, and there's a disagreement on how to spend that money. These conflicts are real, and you got to address them, find out why, but then ultimately forgive and move forward. Another one, competition over limited resources, right? This for me, the, the, the funniest example for me is when you wake up in the morning, and you're tired, and you kind of stumble into the kitchen, you're looking for someone to eat, and you're someone, something, to be clear. Jeez, hometown buffet. Um, you go in, and you're looking for something to eat, and you reach into the pantry, and you're like, who ate the last of the golden grams? And not only did they take the last of it, they didn't put it on the list or go get more, right? Now, that's a basic example, but we have far more complicated examples of limited resources in our lives. There's an argument or a fight about who wants it, who gets it, or how we use it. These conflicts are real. We've got to look for them, and when we find them, we've got to address them, and then we've got to forgive and move forward. Last but not least, sinful attitudes, desires, words, or actions. These, I think, can be the hardest. This is simple sin that we commit against other people, which causes real pain. One example would be someone who gambled away the trust fund, right? Other practical examples would be lying, stealing, real sin that has a real impact on other people. But before we think we can't forgive, think about here, probably the best example would be the prodigal son who functionally did gamble away the trust fund. And what did dad do? He forgave him. He forgave him with a huge, open, excited heart. These conflicts are real. We've got to look for them, and we've got to look to forgive the people who commit them. Now, the Bible, this book is full of conflict. Full of it. And let's just look at some of these early examples. All right? Right off the bat, we got Adam and Eve versus God. God said, sets them up, right? Eden, beautiful places. You can essentially have everything but don't take from that one tree of knowledge of good and evil. What, of course, happens? Satan, the serpent, enters the picture and convinces them they should do just that. Boom, conflict. Adam and Eve versus God. What comes next? This should not surprise anyone. Then you have Adam versus Eve, right? Because what does Adam do when they get accused of doing this? He says, that woman, Adam accuses Eve, can't even take responsibility for his own actions. This, by the way, is really important for us to know. You got a problem with God, I guarantee you that will translate into a problem with other people. If you have a conflict or an argument or a dispute with God, it is going to show itself in your fighting with other people, just like it happened in Adam and Eve. All right, so Adam and Eve, they get kicked out, right? Then we got Cain and Abel. Conflict so bad, someone gets killed. All right, keep reading on Jacob versus Esau big conflict over just essentially a hairy back and a birthright, right? Conflict, conflict, conflict. Then Joseph versus the brothers. Brothers want to get rid of Joseph, actually want Joseph dead. How does Joseph respond? Forgave him and fed him. 
That's how Joseph responded to that conflict. Guys, this is just the first book of the Bible. The Bible is full of examples of conflict for us to learn from how to handle them and somehow not to handle them. This book is a wonderful recipe for how to handle conflict. We've got to forgive, but what does forgiveness mean? I want to give you guys a real kind of uh, def- dictionary definition of forgiveness so you can really understand what we're talking about when it relates to other people. So first, to grant pardon for or remission of an offense or debt. So if someone's hurt you and you just need to forgive and say, I don't want to allow that hurt to be between us anymore. I forgive you. Second, to give up all claim on account of. So someone owes you something. They said they're going to do something. They didn't. They promised you money. They haven't given it to you. To forgive means I'm not going to hold this claim or this debt against you anymore. It's done. You no longer have to repay me. That's forgiveness. Or third, to grant pardon to a person. So this probably applies to some of us. So maybe that person has actually sinned against you or hurt you multiple times. And you just say, you know what? I'm going to be done holding all of it against you. I'm granting pardon to you completely. It's all done. All the sin of the past, I'm putting it behind us. I'm forgiving and moving forward. Now, note number four. And note, by the way, this is a secular dictionary definition of forgiveness. Number four, to cease to feel resentment against, to forgive one's enemies. This is the world's definition, folks. If you forgive, that means you cannot feel resentment against that person. Can't say, I forgive them, but I hate them. That's not how this works. If you forgive, that means you cannot hold that against them or carry that resentment around in your heart. And you got to do it. We must forgive our debtors. Talked about this last week. We're going to talk about it again because we need to understand it and live this out. Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You prayed it. You said it. You probably sang it. Do you mean it? Do you mean, God, forgive me only to the extent that I forgive other people? That's what that as means. We have no choice here. We, you and I, we have to forgive everyone around us. And if you don't, he won't. If you don't forgive, he won't forgive. Matthew six fourteen to 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't think he could have made this any more clear. This is kind of a drop-the-mic moment. There's really not much else that has to be said. If you don't forgive other people, you are not going to experience the full forgiveness of God in your life. And you've got to beware unforgiveness. Not forgiving has very real consequences. I'm going to read you an example from Matthew 18, 23 to 35. And I'm going to read this to you. This is often known as the parable of the unforgiving servant. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. Sound familiar? But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. 
Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Not forgiving people has eternal consequences. We have got to forgive people and move on. Now, when is a good time to do it? As soon as possible, right? But one great practical deadline to give yourself is forgive other people before you worship, before you come to worship and give to the Lord. Matthew 5, to 24. I get it small. I'm going to read it to you. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So, when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. We get explicit instructions here. If you're feeling a little bit of distance from the Lord, there could be multiple reasons for that. But one good one is if you've got something against someone else that you haven't let go. We're literally guaranteed, if you're holding on to some anger, resentment, bitterments against someone else, it's going to interfere with your ability to go completely before the Lord and worship and give all of yourself to him. You've got to forgive other people before you go before the Lord. The good side about this is once you do this, you will find it's incredibly freeing in your ability to worship God completely. Forgive people first. Now, there's a personal, almost a selfish benefit of this. We talked last week about the freedom of forgiveness. When God forgives us the freedom we have, Lewis Smead said this. He's an amazing theologian. I guess his kind of an expert, really, on forgiveness. He said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. When I hold on to bitterness, anger, resentment, pain against another person, I'm hurting me too. I mean, oftentimes, right, that person who hurt us They might not know they hurt us. They might not care. But we still hold on to that pain. We need to forgive for a number of reasons. Because God tells us to. Because it blesses other people. But it will actually help you. You'll find freedom in forgiving other people. Now the good news is you don't have to do this alone. You're not in this alone when it comes to forgiveness. Think about Philippians 2.13. For it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. God is the source of our ability to forgive. There are times when I've gone before the Lord and said, I can't do this. I don't want to forgive. God, help me. Help me. Help me see this person how you see this person. God, give me your grace. Give me your mercy because I don't have it in me right now. And watch what happens. Let him pour into you and give, him, give you his perspective on that person. Now, people can be a great help in this too. Other people around you can actually help you find perspective to forgive other people. Oftentimes when we're hurt, we love to run off to other people and just gripe, right? With no point, no purpose, no goal. Not helpful. What is helpful is to go to someone and say, Hey, this happened to me. Can you help me understand Can you maybe help me understand why this person did this? I have found oftentimes people can provide incredible perspective, and then a light bulb goes off, and you say, oh, that's why they did that. Maybe they didn't mean to hurt me, or maybe they did because of something I had done before. And when that light bulb goes on, you say, oh, yeah, I can forgive that. So go to other people, not just to gripe and complain and to gossip, but go constructively and say, how can I have a better perspective so I can forgive this person? You're not in this alone when it comes to forgiving other people. Y'all familiar with Corey Ten Boom? How many are familiar with Corey Ten Boom? Awesome. A good, good number of you. 
Um, for those of you who aren't, I'll just briefly go through, um, try to summarize what she experienced and what happened with that. Uh, Corey Ten Boom was an incredible woman who was in concentration camps for years. Long, long time. Subject to probably the type of humiliation and discomfort that you and I have never experienced. Fortunately, she made it out, and she made it out with a lot of grace. And this woman went around preaching forgiveness in Europe and the United States with great credibility, right? Because she had suffered so much. Well, at one of these sermons, as she was walking out of that church, she got greeted by one of her old guards in a concentration camp. Probably one of the men who forced her to shower naked alone in front of her. Probably who had done far more awful things to this woman while she was in concentration camps. And this man walks up to her after preaching forgiveness and sticks out his hand to shake her hand. She couldn't do it. She literally wrote her hand froze completely. She said, I can't forgive this man even though I've just preached it. But what she did was brilliant. She prayed alone inside of her mind. She said, Lord, forgive me. I cannot forgive. Lord, forgive me. I cannot forgive. And she said, in that moment, her hand and her heart were unfrozen. How cool is that? She didn't say, God, forgive him. She said, God, forgive me because I can't do what you do. And he gave it to her. And she was able to shake this man's hand. Could we do that? I would hope so if we use this type of a prayer. Lord, forgive me. I cannot forgive. And let that forgiveness pour into you from him. Now, how many times do you have to forgive? 77 times? Right? Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Like looking for a loophole. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Or seven times seven, depending on which translation you're reading. Times. And no, this does not mean that 78 times is too many. Right? You can't have this list out with your good friend or your spouse, and you're like, ah, oh, they, they just lied to me, but that's sin number 76, so I'm going to go ahead and forgive that one. And, oh, I can't believe you just called me that, but that's sin number 77, so I'm going to let that one go. But they were late twice this week. So that's sin 78, I'm done. That's not how this works. Jesus, of course, is playing on Peter's desire to find a loophole. We've got to keep forgiving. It's endless, it's bottomless, we have to keep forgiving. Now, to be clear, reconciliation is a different story, and that is where we're going next week. I will be addressing reconciliation and maintaining a relationship, but forgiveness, you have to keep forgiving. Now, there are times and situations where you need to rebuke, then forgive. Particularly as Christians, if we hold each other to a standard, the standard of God's word, we have to go and say, you know what, you really did sin. And I know, because I know God wants you to be corrected and better and stronger, so we have to rebuke and address the sin, then forgive them. Look at Luke 17, 3 to 4. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. So you have to keep forgiving. But there are wonderful opportunities to go and actually say, hey, this is just wrong. Not because you want to hold it against him forever, but because you want that person to be better and stronger and more like Christ, to be closer to what God calls us to in his word. So you address it, you rebuke it, and then you move on. You forgive and move forward. Now, when we talk about forgiveness, I think we tend to think of it as one action or one thought or one step. And that same author I read to you before, Lewis Smedes, does a good job of breaking forgiveness down into tangible steps that you can think about. One, part of forgiveness is suffering. Suffering. One thing you have to understand is forgiving is not excusing. Forgiveness doesn't say, I wasn't hurt. In fact, forgiveness says, I was hurt. I was hurt so much, I actually need to let this go. There's room for loss and mourning and grieving. Take time for that. 
And it actually found if we don't do that, we actually are slower to forgive. Process, mourn, grieve, acknowledge the suffering. But then step two, he describes it as spiritual surgery. Look into your heart, into your mind, or maybe look into your relationship with someone else and say, I want that out. Surgically remove it from your heart, from your mind. Say, I was hurt, but I don't want it on my heart or mind anymore. I'm going to remove that from how I feel, and I'm going to remove it from how I feel about this person. And then step three, start over. Look at that person with new, fresh, clean eyes, a clean slate. Don't just forgive and move on and stay away from that person, right? Start over in a new, clean relationship with that person. But to do that, you have to get rid of bitterness. When you forgive, you cannot remain bitter. Ephesians 4, 31, 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Bitterness is a very deceptive, sneaky emotion. We think, you know, you're angry at first, maybe because you were hurt, and you've set aside that anger because you said you forgave them. But whenever you think about that person, you have that bad feeling inside of you, that's probably bitterness. Bitterness is a very dangerous emotion. If you truly forgive someone, you can't be bitter towards them. You've got to get rid of it completely. Bitterness is a very powerful indicator of whether or not you've truly forgiven someone in your life. Get rid of bitterness completely. In other words, let it go completely. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love keeps no record of wrongs. You've probably heard that one. Do you live like it? No record of wrongs. Wipe the slate clean. As if it never happened, keeps no record of past wrongs. If it's forgiven, it's done. You cannot bring it up ever again. Forget about it, right? It's as if we're saying, I'm going to forget this completely, which, by the way, we do with God. Psalm 25, 7. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for your good, O Lord. We say to God, God, don't remember me for the sins of my past. It's as if we literally say, God, put on those rose-colored glasses and see me through the lens of your love which are probably rose-colored, by the way, because of the blood of the cross. And if we ask God to see us not for the sins of our past, but because of the love he's given us, we should see other people the exact same way. Remember the sinner, not the sin. Remember the person, the fellow sinner, just like me and just like you, not the sin. Remember they're a fellow person created by God that made mistakes. Just remember that. Don't remember the sin that they committed, if you can. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that forgetfulness next week when we get to reconciliation. Now, I want to address people who just are at a point where you're just not feeling it. You're like, I know I need to forgive, but I'm not feeling it right now. I meet so many people that come and they'll go to a Christian and they'll just say, you've got to forgive them. You've got to do it. You've got to do it now. Doesn't help doesn't help. What helps is to say, why is that? Can we talk about maybe why it is you're struggling to forgive that person? There are times when forgiveness takes time. Yes, we can look at people and say, yes, you are supposed to forgive. You and I are both instructed we have to forgive. And frankly, neither one of us knows when this whole thing's going to end. So you should do it sooner rather than later. But let's talk about why you haven't been able to let it go. How can I help you process this? One of the main indicators, this is one of the things you're looking for. You know you're ready to forgive when you feel sorry or compassion for the person. You might have heard in that parable, I read the word pity, empathy, compassion, sorry. That moment when you realize, you look back at what that person did, and you reflect and you think, ah, maybe they did that to me because that's how they were raised. 
Or maybe they did that to me because someone did that to them. Maybe they did that to me because that's all they're used to. And I get an awesome opportunity to show them the opposite. When you can actually feel and hurt for that person that hurt you, that's a fertile ground for forgiveness. And so as you're helping each other for this, look for that. Help them come to an understanding and a place of caring for why that other person did what they did. And if you're there, it's perfect time for forgiveness. I have wrote in your outline, I've left you a blank because I would like you guys to think who is your prodigal son or daughter, right? Who is the person that you've been holding on to this unforgiveness the longest? And note with the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son was gone. So maybe they're not even in your life now, but you're still holding on to it. Who is your prodigal son? Who is the one that you need to spend time this morning, today, this week, process it with other people, process it with me, that you know you've got to let it go? And note one thing. The prodigal son never apologized. You can't be thinking, well, I know I need to forgive him, but they haven't said a thing about it. They're not sorry. They don't care. That's not the point. Note the father of the prodigal son. Right, think about it. Prodigal son, he does want to apologize. He's going to go back. He's going to go back in all humility and say to the father, I'm not even worthy to be considered your servant. But does dad wait for that? Does dad hang out on the farm and kind of see the sun off in the distance and think, no, I'm just going to play it cool and keep to my farming thing as my son approaches? Or worse, did he stand there and see him and close his arms and give him a stern gaze, make him feel like he wasn't welcome at home? No. He ran out, met him, hugged him, embraced him, and threw a party before he ever heard, I'm sorry. That's forgiveness. That's what we're being called to do, to run out and embrace the person who's hurt you as they come back your direction. Who's your prodigal son? Pray about him. Pray about her. And let's make it so that blank is completely blank, that there's no one on that list. And as you think about this, think about love just overlooking. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. When in doubt, if you are full of love, you're going to find the number of things that bother you get smaller because that love is going to help you to overlook. This pertains especially to little things, minor things not taking out the trash, maybe using a word wrong, maybe interrupting you now and again. You just overlook it because of love. Love overlooks. That's what God is trying to get us to that place, a place of comfort. Look at 2 Corinthians 2, 7 to 8. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. So when someone comes to apologize, rather than give them the long laundry list of all the stuff they've done and say, I forgive you, what if you just rush to that forgiving part? It's, I, it's okay, I get it, I know, I forgive you, I love you. We actually go out and open our arms and bring the sun in. We don't let them stay in their sorrow and their guilt and their feeling bad, but we instead try to love and to comfort. That's what God wants us to do after forgiveness. Now, if none of this was convincing for you about why you need to forgive, this is one of my favorite reasons to do forgiveness. We are God's agents of forgiveness in a battle versus Satan. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I've forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his schemes. Satan wants us fighting. Satan wants us hating. Satan wants us apart. Satan wants us divided. God's given us forgiveness as powerful tools against the devil. If that won't motivate you, I don't know what will. Satan is real, and he is at work, and he wants us against each other. One of my favorite statements 
about the reality of the devil is that the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world he does not exist. C.S. Lewis wrote that decades ago. It was used in the movie Usual Suspects, and it is so true. The devil is real, but he doesn't want us to know it. He wants a world outside that says we can do whatever we want without consequence. I can do whatever I want to other people. I can do whatever I want to my body, and it doesn't matter. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants us to think that we can get into arguments and walk away and have broken relationships. It's not okay. God wants more. He wants us to forgive other people. Think of forgiveness in this way. Go to war against the devil in forgiving and giving mercy and giving grace. Incredibly powerful tools and weapons. Forgiveness allows us to actually break that cycle of revenge. You know that idea that we can get back at someone? I mean, think of pretty much any action movie, right? And it sells. People love this idea that I can get back. You can't get back at them, ever. It's not possible. If you get back at someone for hurting you, all you're going to do is hurt them and hurt you. All you're going to do, regardless of what any action movie is going to tell you. You cannot get back at people. It's only going to hurt you, and it's only going to hurt them. Forgiveness is the only thing that breaks that cycle. But it doesn't make for a very exciting movie, right? So we don't see that a lot. But we can make those movies. We can, in our lives, say, yes, I was hurt, but I decided to forgive. I decided to love. I actually think if told the right way, it makes an incredible story. If we want to be considered children of God, sons and daughters of God, we need to be peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. For they will be called daughters of God. If we want to actually go out to the world and say, yeah, I'm a son and daughter of God, we need to be going out and making peace, not making conflict and stirring up trouble. And if you're sitting there still thinking about that one thing that's too tough to forgive, I want you to contemplate how low can you go. How low can you go as you think about what it is you need to forgive? And here I have to remember Christ on the cross. When he literally was forgiving the people who were killing him as they were doing it, I highly doubt any of you in this room, or I know I personally have never experienced that kind of pain and discomfort, and he forgave them while they were doing it to him. As we take communion this morning, and that's what we're going to do, I want you to thank God. Give me your son's grace, your son's mercy, your son's perspective, your son's power. Make me the type of person that can actually forgive in the moment while they're hurting me. That's what he did. Up on the cross, unbearable pain, forgiving the people causing him that pain. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much because you've initiated forgiveness. You've initiated grace. You've initiated mercy because you've given us grace first. You've forgiven us first. God, I pray that we'll start by being grateful for that and let that just empower us and fill us to go out and forgive other people. May we think about the person that we're holding on to that pain against and lay it before you now. And say, God, it's nothing like what your son experienced on that cross. I'm sorry that I haven't forgiven. God, help me forgive that person. Give us your eyes and your ears for that person who you love just as much as you love us so that we can forgive them. And may we always have in front of our heart, in front of our mind, in front of our eyes what your son did on the cross who didn't just go to the cross but then forgive the very people who put him there. As we take this bread, the body of the Lord broken for us, this cup of juice, his blood poured out for us, May we take in your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness so that we can then share it with someone else.
We love you. It's in your son's name and through your spirit we pray. Amen.